It's time to hear from you. Welcome to Point of View. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in. I'm your girl, Amanda Johnson, and we appreciate you checking us out today. I have the pleasure to be sitting here with Isaiah Jones. Say hello to the people. Hello everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Amanda. It is totally a pleasure. You are a wealth of knowledge, your experience, everything that you've done as far as being an entrepreneur and businesses, seeing your parents start businesses. So just kind of just take us down memory lane and just kind of start wherever you want to start because okay. I know you have so much good information to share. That's it. I want to reel it in. I, it's a lot of information. When I go back like this, uh, like I was saying today, I thought about you guys this morning. And I was looking forward. I say it's a blessing to someone because most of my work was done years ago. I mean, I've been around many years in Chester and uh, I was booming through, let's say, the 70s and 80s with entrepreneurship, DJing. Uh, uh, you know, we, we did food service. I, it's not nothing I haven't done, but I had a time when I did that. And then there was a time that came where I said, OK, I got to reel it in and start looking at a career path you know, once really after my mother died. But I, I think my entrepreneurship, when we talk about being an entrepreneur, I think I got the drive and the example from my parents, the way I was raised. 502 Parker Street, uh, there was an organization that my mother founded. It was called the Black Youth Society. And uh, just today I was getting my hair cut and uh, one of the original members walked in to get her hair done. Uh, and she just exploded with information. She talked about my mother. She went on talking about that, how good of times it was, how they can come to our house and just lay out plans to do things and, and excite each other and talk about things. And it just blew me up. And uh, this book, I went home and got a book. This book is called Eyes of Dreams. This book is written by Lewis Fields. Lewis Fields was the co-founder of Youth in Action. Black Youth Society, as time went on, transform into an agency. The needs and activities and the, the programs that they were providing got so, it, it was so, uh, such a demand till it had to become an agency. He wrote this book and it talks about him and how he got to Chester and all that he did, but he dedicated three chapters of it to my mother and father. It's a very interesting story. If you want to know about Tom Lee and Isaiah Jones and how they affected people and the kids, it's in this book. And uh, so I went and got a copy and took it back to her. She deserved to have it, you know. As an entrepreneur, I learned from my parents, my mother, how to do it. Um, and I think what I didn't realize and what a lot of the kids got back then was a standard. We got a certain standard. And everybody that received that gift from them, it was up to them what they did with it. I looked at it, I call it uh, for myself, I created a standard of excellence for myself. So that means everything that I did going forward, I would put that focus on it. To the point that most people that knew me, a lot of people, you would hear them saying, Ike, why are you so serious? It's not that serious. Take it easy. I didn't feel serious. I felt focused, you know, and I felt like things, if you're gonna do something, you should do it right. I, I look at my mother. She was one of the first ones that I know selling dinners. But she didn't sell a few dinners. When she sold dinners, on that day that she sold dinners, it was planned and executed. She sold hundreds of dinners. What she did was they contacted, and it wasn't hard to do. Back then, you had people working for Sunship. You had people working for Boeing, Sky Papers. All those people she knew would be the lead person, and they would get the orders. And that day, it would be cars dispersed, just delivering dinners. It would be hundreds of dinners. Uh, they would be up all night having fun, playing music, eating, making the food for the next day. Kids. I was a young boy. I had two brothers, two sisters. I wasn't the only child, but I was the most inquisitive. You know, I was most curious because it intrigued me that people would be at our house like that. And they were happy, you know. And so when I, as I grew up, I put my standard of excellence on everything that I did. So when I got the opportunity to create Tommy's Pies, I had a network of support. I wasn't out there just selling a pie. I, just like today, people have been asking me for the last 10 years, literally, everywhere I go, if they know about the Tommy pie, when are you, where are you going to sell those pies again? And I sometimes explain to them that I 
kind of can't just sell a pie. First of all, I don't sell anything without a business structure, meaning insurance. I will not give anybody anything, sell anybody anything unless I have liability insurance. I learned that from a CEO of one of the biggest companies that used to be here in Chester. He was a friend of my mother. His name was Harry Goldstein. He owned Sand Rose Trophies. And I was a little boy, young boy, and they had a fire. And in that fire, it was the structure was sound, so my mother allowed us to do it. I had to get together five or six young boys that wanted to make some money. And what they wanted to do was salvage the trophy mantle pieces at the bottom, the pieces that the trophy set on that wasn't damaged. And, uh, you know, I said to him, I said, wow, you know, I said, how are you going to get all this? How are you going to be able to sell anymore? Will you better? He said, son, anytime you're business, there's something called liability insurance. He said, we have insurance. He said, this is extra. And this is information I probably shouldn't be saying, but he's long gone. God bless his soul. And he said, this is just extra, and winked his eye. I never forgot that. I was only probably 14. But these are the kind of people I was around. I was around all the inspectors to come. When he came into town, he would be at uh, the local, 413, Mr. Jim Harper. And they would come to the house to get collard greens. He wanted my mother's collard greens. So, I mean, she showed me so much. And what happened to me when I came on the scene in Philadelphia, with Todd Pride at Sullivan Community Capital. He was the assistant director to Reverend Leon Sullivan. He took me under his wing because he met me at a, it was like a, uh, it's like a meeting for business entrepreneurs just starting. And, he, and I impressed him. And he said, listen, I'm going to help you. Young guy, very bright corporate guy. And he showed me the ropes. And I ended up in Philadelphia in a corporate office, man, uh, working for him. But I was still incubating and growing Tommy's Pies. We ended up with a lot of stores and um, putting the pies out. When I started here, I started in Chester. I had I just went around and got all the stores in Chester when I first started. That was a risk, and I learned once I got involved with them that you, you cannot do this. You have to be incorporated. You have to be LLC. You have to have insurance. So I don't do anything right now unless I'm ready to go. So that's why I don't bother with the pie, even though a lot of people ask me. Um, but just I, give me a slice. That's all. Just yeah. Yeah, I mean, literally, my neighbors are, you know, Christmas time, I might, I do do a few like that with my neighbors, but I will not go out like that and, and just start selling them for anybody because I just have to be protected, even though I know most people. So it's something that I'm looking at down the line, but again, I work a full time job that comes first. That's what's put bread on the table for me and my family. And I'm not at that point where I want to come away from that yet. You need bread on the table, not just pies, y'all. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> So it's just an incredible life. Um, I started Entrepreneur Attitude at a very young age. I, um, when I started dances, because I was a DJ, okay, a lone DJ by myself, I was the oldest of the boys. When I started, I was playing records for people three and four years older than me. Because my mother and them would have these talent shows, they would have these bands, the Love Lads, uh, what's the name of the one group? Um, the Levitations, I had to write that down, The Signs of Time. The New Tones, the, I mean, bona fide groups. I mean, Sign of the Times was an awesome band. It was like Breakwater. We had Breakwater, Forest Blue. These are great uh, performances by just regular people in the city of Chester. Wow. You know, students, Chester High students. And uh, so I was sitting around watching that. And, uh, you know, and as the armory grew, you know, I grew out of that because I was doing, um, I was doing uh, sound sound with, uh, it was a guy named Jim Greathouse. Uh, he had a sound company I would rent equipment from. He took me with him to do sound. So I ended up at the Civic Center. I did a cameo, slave and wax show. I ran the, the, the wires, just simple stuff, running cords, chasing speaker cords and uh, microphone cords, sitting next to the uh, PA guy. I remember cameo came down, one of the guys, and hand, hand the, uh, the guy next to me the tape for their introduction. I was right in on all that. I did, um, I did uh, radio uh, with um, Tamla Henry, Thera Martin, internship at WDAS. I also played at WDNR at Widener. Uh, Miss Elizabeth Sims' brother, I can't remember his name, he got me into that. I did that for a short time. Um, so by the time the Armory really got took off, there was people coming in that I came out in 1979. Most of the crew that I had with me was younger than me. They was my two brothers' age. So what I did, this is the first real move in entrepreneurship, I branched off 
and took bars. So I had about three bars going on. Saturday night when the Armory was jumping, I would be doing three other bars. I had guys working for me. And I would just float, play a little bit, float here, it was fun. But I was outgrowing things, you know. So a lot of people don't know how effective I was when it came to structuring the music and DJ and structure for United Funk Enterprise, it was called. But the good thing is my two brothers picked up and they went to another level. They went to the era that it came in, scratching and mixing that came in at that time. And that's what they perfected. And it was a blessing. I had nothing to do with it. My brother Tom, he would be in the room scratching and mixing. Eric, they would practice that. And sure enough, the time came and that is what happened, you know. So I would take them to New York. We would go to New York and buy records. I would take them to DC, you know, show them how, how crazy it was. I took them to their first concert so they can see the effects of sound and lights. My brother uh, took Tom to see uh, uh, Rick James. So he saw what I was talking about, the sound, you know, so they understood. And uh, so I started entrepreneur in that way. Uh, there was other, other things that I've done. Um, I used to drive a van, like for churches. You know, anything. One time, uh, there was a representative, Scott Papers, who came into the office, and she was a young lady, public relations. And they were putting up a new um, section to Scott Papers, but it was going to make a loud sound. You have to let, by public notice, you have to let the community know within a certain radius that this is going to take place. So when it goes off, they were, they were, they're aware of it. So it's like somebody running a train through the back of your house, you know, and you're not knowing that the horn is going to blow right in that area. So you have to know that. And so she came to me and I said, yeah. She said, well, can you get these papers distributed, you know, through the community? I said, sure. She said, however you get it done. She said, we'll see you when it's done. You know, we'll check the community. I said, fine. Get it done. It was thousands of papers. I organized, I think, five or six guys right from my community. They paid me and I paid them. Always being transparent, always being honest. So the standard of excellence, standard of uh, being honest, standard of having a, a plan, that's how I lived. And it, it rubs some people wrong. It intimidates a lot of people. Some people mislike you for that, for no reason. I, you know, a lot of times uh, I, I sense that and I had that coming up. It used to bother me, but it don't bother me now, you know, because mm -hmm. I understand that I'm doing the right thing, you know. Um, Tommy's Pies took off because I think of what my mother did early on. God bless me. I think he blessed me with opportunities because of that. Mm -hmm. I had the investor tell me, he said, you know, this money that I'm giving you, it's money because an African-American lady used to feed me and my sister. He said, because I used to step over my father coming from school. He said, and when we were hungry and cold, she took care of us. He says, so I'm giving back because of her to you. Wow. You know? Wow. Just like you, I mean, the interest you put in me, I mean, we probably years apart, you and your husband, <laughs> you know, and I went into that room to tell a story. It's all honest and open. It's in me. It's nothing I have to write or make up. I got a little things jotted here so I won't forget them. But basically the, 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 the basic story I know and for you to ask me to do this, I was very humble by it. <laughs> it is a pleasure. So what we are going to do, we are going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back and just kind of go through some tips and things of being an entrepreneur, some things that you've learned that, okay. you know what, maybe I'll share that with that person that yeah. might be thinking about it. So we'll be right back right after this. What's your point of view? It's time to hear from you. Welcome to Point of View. Hey everybody, welcome back. Thank you so much for all that wealth of knowledge. But right now it's time for us to dig our boots in a little bit and talk about being an entrepreneur. So let's first let's talk about the a few of the businesses that you've had of experience and then we're gonna kinda get some questions that will help mm -hmm. our fellow entrepreneurs out there. Okay. Um I got the catering business. Me and my wife did it, but we got it from my mother. But when you do that, you want to be busy. And I had a really good network, a young lady by the name of Lori Pittman. She was involved with the Chester Biddy League Banquet, that, that, and she kept me busy every year with them. Local 413 kept us busy, and um, uh, we did a lot of freelance stuff, but um, again, I never done anything with a purpose or a plan. 
So I had a, a, a standard of a plan and action. And you have to utilize, you can't be an entrepreneur and look at making 100% yourself. You cannot do that. You have to incorporate other people's gifts. Like right now, um, there's two young ladies that uh, are very good bakers. I have one that can do cheesecakes and do all kind of cakes. Um, I have a bakery in Philly that I worked with when I was in pie business, and this guy does nothing but rum cakes, um, especially on the holidays. But I have, you know, I would if I had a need for that, I would probably go to him. But now I have a young lady right here in Chester that can do that herself. I have another young lady that does these kits. There's a bottle of alcohol in it. It's like a gift. She can do all these flavored strawberries. She does cookies real well. Um, so if I was in business, again, I would incorporate some of those folks. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah. Because a lot of people think, oh, I got this idea. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. And it's just you. <laughs> yeah, because my lane is just a pie. I'm not a chef. I'm not a, a baker, per se, other than uh, there's a few things that I do do. But um, these young ladies are good at what they do. And the brand, it would make the brand stronger. Okay. So that's what I'm looking to do. So on that note, how important is a solid team? It's very important. And your team have to be versatile. They have to be willing to fit in their lane without being offended, you know. And the first thing first is to structure your business. Have your business plan. So you have a, a plan to go by. Um, you have to have your insurance, like I said. You have your name. And most important, to get your credit, you must need, you should have your own UPC code numbers. They're, they are read by Dun and Bradstreet. That, that's what vendors, big vendors, like I had all these stores like uh, ShopRite, I had Acme, um, I had Fresh Grocers. Those are huge supermarkets. Fresh Grocer was a small market, but it made just as much money as uh, Acme uh, markets would because they were in the, the inner city. And those 10 stores could really build, you know, so I gave that up when I stopped, but I had a good reason. So if you have your UPC number and every time that is scanned, Dun & Bradstreet credits your company name. So if somebody wanna look you up, they go to Dun & Bradstreet, your rating is on there. And they say, okay, yeah, if it's 10 vendors, like myself, small, they'll say, oh, well, he's got a track record. And they may pick you over the next guy. So that's what you want. Wow. Get that track record up. Yeah, the track record, that's your, your paper trail to wow. show that you're a credible company. And that's good for your line of credit. It's also good for your loans, your business loans and all, because the bank is going to look for that. Oh, you're Tommy Spies? You know, where you been? Where you come from? He said, oh, you can check me out. I've been around for a while. I had this, that, and other accounts. And you don't have to do that because they'll just go right to the credit. And business credit is read through Dun & Bradstreet. Wow, that's good information. Yeah. So if someone, let's talk to that new new business owner. Mm -hmm. They have the idea, they have a small team. Mm -hmm. What would be your first, the first thing you would recommend that they do? First thing I recommend they do that they get their business plan so they know what they want to do. That way when people ask them, when they're asking for money, uh, what they want to do, they have the plan they can handle and they can relate to that. They can refer and conversate from that. They're not reaching for straws and they, they look more professional and look more stable. And secondly, look for support systems. We're minorities. We don't come with millions of dollars behind us. We're not public when we come in. You start from nothing most of the time. If you got great credit and you're, you're eligible to get a loan, then that's more power to you. If you're eligible to get a loan for fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to put into a business, then that's a great start. Everybody can do that. You know, so you want to, um, uh, have a network that will walk you through that, that can look for grants for you, look for monies for you. You know, um, that's, that's one of the things I did. I, I belonged to so many organizations. When I, you know, I was always busy. I was at a lot of food shows. I used to do food shows. That's another thing that uh, put my company out there. Um, now that you have, I didn't have the Facebook and all. I wasn't using that then. And I should have, but I wasn't. And, um, we used to do these massive food shows, be in Atlantic City, be up in Harrisburg, uh, 
in different places and it'd be thousands and thousands of people come up and I had a great setup you know with the posters and things like you this setup you have is beautiful here and we'd be set up like that and be pies there you know and your cards and you you start that way so have a network where you have your marketing plan down have your resources that can give you leads and have uh, your financial people on board you know and have your legal down have your insurance and your representation together okay so uh, while you were saying that I would have to think about how important is an elevator pitch well it depends on who it is I had that happen depends on who it is some people you can't approach that way because it irritates them you can tell by a person's demeanor whether they're like that I've met people all right for example um, <laughs> the, the owner of uh, the founder of uh, Ronald McDonald house he was down to earth he was down to earth our idea at the time was just to get to know him I didn't really have a plan but we got to know him and he got involved with us you know and maybe down the line it could have been something to come out of it uh, maybe it's a small Tommy's pies because later we thought about putting pies in places like McDonald's and all but a guy like the person like him I remember I also was able to approach the founder of Steakum the chip steak Steakum and he was cool but then there's some people you have to be able to read a person but sometimes it works sometimes it works but if you do that you got to be like that you got to have it all together because they, they may ask you anything one time I got stuck I was on an airplane um, me and Todd was coming back from Florida it was a guy there from um, I can't think of the chain of uh, supermarkets in Florida I can't think of the name of it right now and I said something to him and he said something back to me and I didn't understand it Todd was right behind us he cut in now if I was by myself on that flight I would look like I didn't know what I was doing and that's what can happen you have to be sharp yeah. if you do that so you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them yes <laughs> when you need to use that elevator pitch but nonetheless you should have one correct yes you okay. should you should be always be ready because it could be any time you see somebody any opportunity like right now I got this book and you know I wanted I had to read it I got to read it again because I want people if I get a chance to shop it to somebody I want if they ask me questions I want to be prepared you know I can't just tell them well go to chapter 8 through 10 and my mom and, and dad is in there read that you know it's got to be more well, between page 10 and 15 <laughs> go ahead and look that at me <laughs> yeah yeah being an entrepreneur I don't think it's for the faint of heart mm -hmm. earlier you said that um, people may not have known how to take you they they you they felt it you, yeah. you'd say why are you being serious and you're like wait I'm not serious mm -hmm. I'm focused mm -hmm. so just talk about being focused right like is how important that is because some people might want you know we get that one family member who want to play like you messing up my money what's go you know yeah. so just kind of talk about being you're right focused. I mean, because even with my brothers and we're all different you know but they knew how I was about things you know and then they got involved and they did things their way but uh, people that you come aboard as friends or associates and things those people you have to stay in your lane you have to stick to who you are you can't change because you want to be accepted by people you can't care if they're offended or you, s you sense envy I sense envy a lot but some people don't even know it I still help them, still talk to them and everything because that sometimes makes them better I, I feel I mean not to be I'm not boasting anything but I know I made a lot of folks more focused on what they were doing because of my example being that way um, I think that um, you have to know who you are man at all times mm -hmm. you have to know you I'm not gonna throw away the way I was raised I'm not gonna throw away what my mother and father put in me just to be your friend or to get along with you I'm not gonna throw away uh, the insight and the time I put in trying to build a business or trying to be someone because you're offended by the way I approach it but another thing on the other side of, um, of a standard of having a standard of excellence there could be a judgmental side of you so you got to watch that too so I had to curb that at times you know if someone don't do things or think or say things the way I think they should be done I have to make sure that I don't judge them it goes two ways you okay. know so that makes me think about 
being on the team, bringing your team together. I know for me personally, I feel that if you're bringing a team together and the personalities may not fit or blend, the I guess the bottom line for me is can we move forward even when we don't agree? Do we have the same goal or is that even important? It's very important. And uh, you said it, it had to be talked out. You'll get to a point, we used to sit across the table up in Philadelphia. I worked for Sullivan Community Capital, but we did multitude of things out of that office and it was beautiful. We was right on 20th and Market, or 20th and Arch. Todd Pride laid out a great place for us to work and we were working on a project, um, Touch Easy Tax. And what it was, it was a uh, application computerized that we put in a kiosk where people could do their own taxes. It was a brilliant idea. And you simply walk up to it and you put your own information and who knows your own social security and birthday better than you. Yes, all you're doing is telling the guy across from you that at uh, H&R Blog, you're telling them the stuff. You know it, you can do it yourself. They wouldn't trust it. But anyway, in that, I found out another side of me that I could do pitches. And, um, you know, so I met a lot of people, end up putting that machine in places you wouldn't believe, you know, supermarkets and things like that. And we did okay. But me and him was different folks. I mean, Todd was very strategic in his planning and he was very poised. And uh, I found out that's a value now to have, to be able to respond under pressure in a calm manner, to be able to think under pressure. He had all that, he had a lot of experience. And I was go, 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 like you're saying. I remember I had a deadline to get a contract in for, I had a big contract with food service in Philly, with all the mm -hmm. schools, right? And uh, I had a deadline, but like you said, like, your broker that represented you on this did a great job. You have a no bid contract. That means nobody bid it against me. Nobody wanted to run in, that, in and out of those schools. I, I was taking sweet potato pie in all these schools. Martin Luther King School, all kind of grats, all kind of schools. And nobody wanted to be bothered with that. So I had a no bid contract. It was work forever. But it was a deadline and I was antsy all that morning. I was rushing, rushing. And he was like, you don't have to worry about it. If you didn't take this in the day, nobody wants that work. Nobody wants to service those kids. And that's what it was. Wow. And so we were able to get along um, because I toned down. He actually made me stronger. Less stress, less anxiety, and I learned to use my head mm -hmm. from him. And so you can do it, but sometimes it can't work. Sometimes you just, it, it won't work. Yeah, sometimes you just have to look for team members. You do. Because the, initially your first thought was like, uh, you're a little edgy, but maybe that might be what you need. Or you're yeah. a little cocky, maybe well, that research. might be what you need. I think the research on people's background, what you need. Like I talked to you guys earlier, marketing is not my thing. I have good ideas, but how to execute it in marketing, I uh, wouldn't be the best person to do that. I'm more strategic in what I want to do with the product or where I wanted to go. So how we sell that, it would be somebody else. Like so now, I wouldn't have to do much research. I know you guys can do that. Right. You know what I mean? But that's what you do. You you pick a partner that you you both going to benefit from it. They're going to enjoy what they're doing and you're going to enjoy what you're doing. That right there is key because from a lot of the things that I've been seeing, we see one person winning and the other one. That does not say team to me. No. Everybody should be weeding, eating, as they say. We all going to eat. Right. If one person over there eating steak and you only got french fries, something wrong with that picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so before we go, I want you to dig deep. Mm -hmm. Think about that one entrepreneurial experience that you could not have found in a book that you learn that you can share with somebody that's watching? Uh, I think when I was starting and I started to shop the pie and I would be asked could I provide volumes like uh, I got it Publix. Publix was is the market I was talking about in Florida. Okay, if you do a Publix, you got to provide X amount of pies. There's no way I can bake 10,000 pies to supply their chain. 
when my stuff moved, it moved in tractor trailers to Acme and ShopRite. It was picked up that way. I couldn't have had that happen if it weren't for Michael's Bakeries. So when I walked into Michael's Bakeries, and he, the guy looked at me and I met John Liss, and I told him what I was trying to do. I was, I was coming from nowhere. I had no track record, no money up front to give him. And he walked me through a bakery that I've never experienced. The ovens were so big, I used to have to look in a window at the, my pies, and it'd be over my head. And that, I think, was something that bit me. And when I came out of there, I hadn't realized what happened. And Todd again, he said, man, you, you're on your way. He said, you talk to that guy, right? He said, there's no way those guys would take a chance like that. He said, that guy is, he said, you looked that company up? I said, no. I just, I said, I called Tasty Cake and tried to get them to talk to me. And it was one lady, it was a corporate lady there. And she told me that she's not using any office. She said, but I think you should call this guy, John Liss, over at Michael's Bakeries. She said, I'm involved in production here. She said, but it's not really what I do. She said, we don't contract with anybody else. She said, Tasty is their own. She said, but I wish you luck. She said, you call John, I think he can help you. I don't remember her name. She said she's not normally in that office. And when I called that number, she picked that phone up. That was something that uh, happened that I don't think would normally happen to anybody. Nobody gives information out like that. And when I made that call to John, I mentioned her name, he knew right away. And he said, come up. And when I walked in there, me and Todd, when we came out, we had a deal. Mm. That was the most powerful thing for me. I could imagine a young guy coming out of Chester with a pie in his hand. Another one, I went, I flew down to uh, Chick-fil-A headquarters in Atlanta. It was crazy. I did not understand the process of getting a product somewhere. I flew down there with a pie literally in my hand. I had nothing else, I just carried a pie in a box. I had a box to carry. And I called a cab from the airport to the headquarters, asked for the person I talked to. They came out, they treated me very nice, walked me in, offered me drink, and they tasted the pie, said it's very good, and they explained that that's not the process that they do. They're not currently looking for any new desserts. At the time, they had a brownie. Um, but that was experience. That was experience because I felt something. I just didn't do it right. Hmm, you know? Gotcha. So sometimes you just have to walk through the process. You have to walk through the process to learn. You really do. So anybody out there, there's no perfect way to do it. Things got to happen. You got to get breaks. John List was my break. Michael Bakery's was my break. It still should be benefiting me, but I don't look back. I think things happen for a reason. I think if I ever do this again, I would have learned so much at this point now. Just like right now, I won't hustle a pie, a few pies. I won't do it mm -hmm. uh, because I have to make a living off of Please, <laughs> please make me a pie. <laughs> please. <laughs> you promise you won't. <laughs> Can I just get a slice and slither <laughs> But I know that you're getting that all over the place because I do the way just a couple the of uh, my buddy uh, <laughs> Brian asked. She said, "Man, when are you gonna do another set of pies?" Now, now this guy is a blessing. He's the one that introduced me to the company I'm with now. He was in there 40 years. That's the kind of brotherhood I I established to my mom's and my mother and father relationship and their time in Chester. People helped me. Wow. Well, this has definitely been awesome. I know that the people are waiting. You just have to be patient and pray. Like, I know somebody's like, look, I will do a Tina Turner impersonation for you. I just, <laughs> just give me a I'm going to give it to him. I really am. I want to do it great. I'm going to give a lot away when it starts, too. I mean, I, I got a plan. I am you know. excited. I'm so excited. So we're getting ready to wrap it up. Is there anything, final words you'd like to share? Yeah, I want to thank my wife. She's been with me for over 40 years. She catered with me. She taught me how to do that. When my mother wasn't able to do it, uh, we had great food. Uh, when I do the, when I did the pie, she went up to the bakery with me, and we specified we got that spec down in their lab. Uh, and then later, I did get a food scientist, but she we had to do the initial mix, and we got the legal agreements and everything in place. She's always giving me great advice. Um, she was going to come with me tonight, but it was raining, and we gave all our umbrella. One of our cars is being worked on, and all the umbrellas is in that car. And I, I started something over there. I said, no, nah, just let it go. I want to thank her for just believing in me, no matter what I do. 
My kids, Dre and Ike and uh, Isaac and Ian, they're good boys. They believe in their dad. They love me, I know it. They support me, you know. Um, and special thanks to who really got me pumped up today. And I thank God for her, Joanne Collins Cork. She walked into that bar, that hairdresser and barbershop, it was a unisex shop, and she really talked about my parents and the good times we had, and it just blew me up, you know. Um, and it's just everybody that's uh, Dr. Strand for where, where I am now spiritually. That's another reason why I'm not worried about the entrepreneur and so much. I'm, I'm in a place of peace finally. Um, I lost my mother and father, and that affected me. We didn't get into that today, but that affected me to the point that I walk around almost every other day thinking about something they said to me or something that happened because of them. Sometimes I laugh. You know, my mother was very funny. She's smart, my father was strong and tough, and I find myself acting a lot like him. Um, but uh, I'm very grateful for where I'm at today through the grace of God and that he allowed me to meet you too, mm. your husband and yourself. And uh, I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It is our pleasure. We thank you so much, and we will definitely be seeing more of Mr. Isaiah Jones. But right now, I want to thank you for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Also, want to send a special thanks out to my brothers, Tom and Eric Jones, for picking up the ball with United Funk Enterprise. When I got older, I was working a job and promoting. We did a big show up in Philadelphia with uh, Lady B and Wagner's Ballroom and all the rap people. We brought them down on the bus. We got involved heavy with those rap guys, a lot of them that made it, uh, Kumo, B, Kumo D, we knew the Sugar Hill people, um, Grandmaster Flash, uh, Jazzy Jeff, we knew all those guys before they even got into it. But uh, I want to thank them because they took you, United Folk Enterprise, to a new level, into a new time, the 80s, you know, through 80, through 89, you know, before we stopped it all together. So I want to send a special thanks out to my two brothers, Tom and Eric Jones. Tell me what's your point of view? What's your point of view? What's your point of view? It is your view. Point of view. Point of view. What's your point of view? It's time to hear.